to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Remember when we got to chapter 8, we're moving through this section of Christian liberty. You've got to know that that's what it's about or you're going you're to get bogged down in some of the things Paul is saying. It's about Christian liberty. Not liberty to escape from responsibilities. Not liberty to dodge ministry. But liberty to, to engage full focused and not be weighted down by the things that don't matter. Even religious things, if you remember in 1 Corinthians 8. Even religious things should not bog us down for liberty. For the liberty we have in Christ. Free to serve him and free to serve others in the gospel. So we looked last couple of weeks at chapter 8, this, uh, the, the constraints placed on liberty, that, that love places constraints. Remember we talked about the book, uh, Walt Chantry's uh, book, Shadow of the Cross, Studies in Self-Denial, and he says in this chapter on Christian liberty that, the, that this wide open field that we've been given by Jesus, he says, I've come to them, I'd have life and have it abundantly. This wide open field of Christian liberty is bounded by a fence called self-denial. You're going you're gonna to really see how he, Paul focuses in on this in chapter 9. We're not going to get through chapter 9 today. We're going to start it and try to make our way through it responsibly. Chapter 9, though, verses 1 to 23. We are going to read the whole chapter. I hope you found that in your Bibles and would stand with me. If you don't have your Bible with you, we're going to put the screen on the text for you, but we really truly want to do what we can to get you your own copy of the Holy Word in your hands. Sometimes I shudder to think there are people who gather with us. The only time they look upon the scriptures for the whole week is when they see them on this screen. I don't want that to be true of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Follow along as I read verses 1 to 23. Paul asks a lot of rhetorical questions. You're going to see this here. He's not asking people to give him answers. He knows the answer. He's pressing them by the nature of the questions he's asking. So listen to this. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I'm not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruits? Who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things of human authority? Does not the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake, because the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we've sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. That's, we're going to look at that today, okay? Let's read on. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. 
to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. We have a fun passage to unpack. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord press upon us. What Paul says here, what we've sung today, the wonderful freedom we have in Christ is not to dodge, but to engage. To engage. We're free. We're, chains have fallen off. The heart's been set free. God help us to rise. Go forth and follow him in that freedom. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, uh, chapter 8 has shown us liberty is, is li limited by his love for the weak brother. Strong in the weak, remember? It's limited by love. Chapter 8, folks are troubled, having come out of a pagan culture where they practiced meat sacrifice. They ate it as a part of their worship. They used the, the temples to invite friends and family in for a special banquet, eating meat sacrificed to idols. They sold the leftovers in the market so that you could go into the market and purchase meat and potentially be eating meat sacrificed to idols. And it troubled the weak greatly because they had come out of that culture. They did not want to be remotely identified with that anymore. They'd been saved, transformed, set free in Christ. So it troubled them at the thought that, that strong believers could eat meat, could, could go to the to the celebrations, not the worship service of the temple, but the celebrations held in the temple for their friends and families or different banquets. Greatly troubled the weak. Paul said, don't be a stumbling block to these. We looked at that the last couple of weeks. He shifts his emphasis now to talk more specifically about him. He wants to set forth an example of how the Corinthians should move through this matter in Corinth. And it becomes for us a great example, a challenge, if you please, to ask ourselves, am I using the, if, if you recognize, by the way, if you recognize that you were in the bondage of sin, you were blinded and in darkness by sin, and you've been set free by the grace of of God shown to sinners in Jesus Christ, if you have experienced that saving reality, the question must be asked, am I using my liberty to do as I please? Am I using my liberty to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ? Joshua mentioned the song that they just sang. That's really why we're still here. Every now and then just stop and inhale and exhale and say, if I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, why am I still here? The answer is to use the liberty in Christ to advance the gospel, to advance the gospel. And so Paul says in effect in this passage, I'm not asking you to forego more rights than I forego myself. In other words, these, when, I, when I make an appeal to you who would be recognized as strong in Corinth, a strong believer in Corinth, I'm not asking you to forego more rights than I, than I do. For the sake of the gospel and for the sake of those whom it benefits, I surrender not only what any Christian may claim, but what I can claim as an apostle. So he, he's really making an argument from the greater to the lesser here. When we get down to verse 19 next week, Lord willing, the essence of what he's talking about here, though I'm, I'm free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. 
So this passage develops along three, three lines, and we're going we're to look at one today. But really the whole passage, first of all, it establishes Paul's rights uh, as a Christian, but mainly as an apostle, verses 1 to 18. We'll try to take that up today. It reminds the readers of his willing renunciation of those rights in the interest of the gospel, verses 15 and 18. And then it points to other concessions that were made by him for the sake of the gospel. That's the, that's the tag there. If you, want, if you want to hang something on chapter 9, verses 1 to 23, for the sake of the gospel. In fact, it's a good, it's a good byline to have as a follower of Christ when you, when you live daily, for the sake of the gospel. So we're just going to look at the, these 14 verses divided into two thoughts, really thoughts and more thoughts. Thoughts on Paul's rights as an apostle. He, he asked these rhetorical questions. The, the nature of the questions, if you could read them in, in the original language, is, am I not free? Of course I am. Am I not an apostle? Of course I am. Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And he's talking about there the, that road to Damascus encounter where he said he was he encountered the resurrected Jesus as one born out of due season. He talks about that later. These are not you my workmanship in the Lord? Is it, isn't the church at Corinth where God sent me to labor and was pleased to birth a church? Does not your existence as a church in Corinth become evidence of my apostleship. Now, we say, why is he making such a big deal like this? Because remember now, we've talked about this through the years. We've studied Galatians. We brought this up to you. There was a group of folks, and they're, they're just given the tag. They didn't call themselves this. We've given the tag, the Judaizers. The Judaizers were a group of Jewish people who, who would say that they came to know Jesus Christ out of Judaism, but they never left Judaism. Their mentality was, it's good that you have acknowledged Jesus Christ as, as the Messiah, that you claim to be, belong to him and he is yours. But have you, have you embraced the fullness of Christ in things like ritual circumcision? And so these folks followed Paul around. If you want to get a real flavor of this, go read 2 Corinthians sometimes. And just when he, talk, when he starts talking about the super apostles, it's, it's tongue in cheek, it's sarcastic. He's talking about these Judaizers who came in and they would question his apostles. They would basically come in and say, well, it's great. It's wonderful that, you, that Paul came and preached and he's told you about Jesus and we're so thrilled that Jesus has come as God's Messiah and all. But have you, have you followed Jesus as you should follow Jesus by being circumcised? Do you, do you celebrate the, the wonderful history of ceremony in Judaism, which all anticipated the coming of Messiah. Are you, are you incorporating all, what, what? Paul didn't tell you about that? Oh, wow. I mean, he himself grew up celebrating all of this. And he didn't tell you about that? What a shame. What a shame that Paul is robbing you from the fullness you can experience in the Messiah. You see that stuff? That's what's going on. And so he, he's, he's almost going overboard here. Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord? Are you not my workmanship? If to others I'm not an apostle, that's what he's talking about here, the Judaizers. If to others I'm not an apostle, surely I am to you. Surely I am to you. Because in fact, you're the seal. This word seal here often speaks of the of the evidence, the proof of if a, if a king or a ruler sent a letter or a decree, he would, uh, he would take the letter, ro roll it or fold it, have some uh, wax melted on it. And he had a signet that he wore. It was his unique signet, his ring. And he would press that upon the letter. Over the, and so it would be sealed. If it's broken, when it comes to the people, there's a problem there because they're not supposed to mess with a seal. If it comes and it's got his seal on it, that's a seal of authenticity. Paul says, that's what you are to me, you Corinthians. With all the stuff that was going on, with all of this, this imperfect church, trying to flesh out implications of a perfect gospel, Paul says, you're my seal. And he says, in fact, when I have to make defense to those who go around questioning my apostleship, 
I point to you and others like you. And say, how do you explain what has sprung up in a totally pagan and Gentile culture with no background? How do you explain it? Other than a work of God, he was pleased to work through me. Now, this is Paul's argument that's going on here. He says further, do we not have the right to eat and drink? Now, he's going he's to talk about these, uh, this, this liberty that he has here. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, he says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. In other words, Paul was not going to get bogged down in, in the liberty he had rather was going to exercise the liberty he had to advance the gospel. He wasn't going to get bogged down in me. My. Mine. He just, Paul didn't operate that way. Galatians 5.1, we read it to you last week. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Do you not realize that anything that you must have to be content to be happy that is outside of Jesus Christ becomes a snare to take you into a yoke of slavery. No, 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 not, a, not, the, not the headlong plunge into wantonness, but the devil's subtle lure that I've got to have this. If I only had this. Paul says, don't. Don't submit to a yoke of slavery for freedom that Christ has set you free. And so we need to do inventory, I think, from time to time. And I have to do this. When I, if I find myself being discontent, I have to stop and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait. What? What am I discontent about? What am I discontent with? Face up like a maturing believer and say, are you not? Are you not questioning the capacity of Jesus Christ to give fullness of life? You follow what I'm saying here? You realize it's the other ditch. It's the ditch on the other side of the Judaism issue, the Judaizers. It's great that you have Christ, but do you have circumcision? And it's not just, it's great that you have Christ, but do you have tongues? It's great that you have Christ, but do you have miracles? It's great that you have Christ, but do you have all these? Uh, the ditch is, oh, I have Christ. Christ is all I need. But if I just had, <laughs> we just can't we counter what we just said. So Paul is really wanting to press this to them here. And he does this along these lines. There are three rights he asserts in verses 4, 5, and 6. His first is the right to financial support by the church members. He said, do we not have the right to eat and drink? Now this is a, you're going to see him uh, address this a little more thoroughly. You know. Don't we? And, and the point behind this, and you're going to see this as he develops, is that if we labor among the people of God, we have the right to benefit from that labor, he's going to make it more pointed when he starts giving some analogies of that. It's the right to financial support. He's going to say later on in these verses, but I have rejected that. So I don't want to become a stumbling block. And you can't appreciate this if you've not been in, in full-time Christian ministry, how there's always somebody to come along who will, uh, I had a fellow years ago, years ago, who called me, this has been decades ago now, who called me a Mernister. Mernister. He said I was a mercenary minister, that I was in it for the money. There's always somebody come along that'll do that. Always has been, always will be. There'll always be folks that want to talk to you about your income and over and over and over, and then look at you and say, well, it's all about money for you. And I, I want to say, you're the guy talking about the money, not me. 
Paul's keenly aware of this, but he's going to reject all that because he wants to be free. And I tell you, it's, a, it's one of those things that if I can be, have a holy jealousy, I have a holy jealousy of Paul. The right to financial support by the churches. The first, verse 5 is the right to marriage. Now, when he says what he says here, and I like the way the, the, the ESV really captures the essence of it here, verse 5. Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife? That's the picture here. It's not just a marriage, but by the way, he cites Cephas here. Cephas is Peter. You know who Peter is, don't you? The, the first pope. Peter had a mother-in-law, if you know how to read scripture. But it's not just the fact of marriage. That, that was not really an issue until Roman Catholicism co-opted uh, the whole uh, advance of Christianity and started adding all these things onto it that's got no business being there. What he's saying here is to take along a believing wife. In other words, the brothers do that, the other apostles, Peter does that. Don't they have the right to take along? In other words, don't we have the reasonable expectation that if we go into a place and take along a believing wife, that they should be cared for too? That's his argument here. As do the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord, and Cephas. The third thing is the right to exemption from what we call secular labor. If, if, and the people will debate whether there is such a thing and everything's sacred. But the point he's making here is, don't we have the right if we fully invest and engage in gospel ministry to be cared for? So he says, or is it only Barnabas and I? There's a small parenthesis here. He and Barnabas, remember, had been at odds with one another. Barnabas went with John Mark. Silas joined Paul. The fact that he mentions Barnabas here, some commentators say, this is such a refreshing thing. They're, they're connected again. Whether they're, whether they're laboring together again or not, the fact that he brings him up means that there's, a, there's been a reconnect there. Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? So he's, he's arguing for them. He says, when I tell you, the strong, that you should practice self-denial in the context of liberty, I'm not telling you to do something that I'm not willing to do. The point is, I have all these rights, but I'm not, I'm not grasping them. I'm not arguing for them. I'm not insisting on them. In fact, we know that, that he was a tent maker. He made his living off of that. And then when one of the churches deigned to send him a gift like the Philippians did, he just he rejoiced, thanked them for their generosity. What a blessing that was. But I want you to see today, Paul was driven by the advance of the gospel. And the point he's trying to make to the Corinthians is you should be driven that way too. You should not knowingly do anything that will hinder the advance of the gospel. You should not knowingly do anything that will cause others to stumble. If you are strong, then that means you're what? You're a disciple maker. What should you be doing with the weak? Making disciples. And that's his challenge. Then he goes on from, from verse 6 into verses 7 to 14 where he gives some more thoughts on this matter. I want us to see these verses together. He says, who serves, and this is where he gets more specific, who serves as a soldier at his own expense? In other words, doesn't someone who enlists in the army have the expectation uh, that the army will, will remunerate them for their service? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? You know, there, there were principles in the Old Testament for, for harvesting, sowing and reaping. And there were provisions even made when they would go and, and reap a field. Not only were they entitled to the first fruits, but they were told, taught in the law now, leave the corners of the fields unharvested so that the poor can come in and harvest in the corners and, and themselves have food to eat. It was... The, the scripture had the best welfare system that's ever been devised. And ours is the worst. 
that's ever been devised. The scriptures made free men and women out of their system. Ours make slaves out of its system. Who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Same principle here. So he's used three analogies. A soldier, a vine dresser, and a shepherd. People engage. There's an expectation, a reasonable expectation, that they will receive material benefit from it. And implied here is in the failure for that means somebody has wronged somebody. Then he says, do I say these things on human authority? In other words, is this just Paul talking uh, because he's blinded by the fact that he's engaged in ministry? Watch what he does here. This is fascinating. Does not the law say the same thing? I want to challenge you to go home today and read chapter 24 of Deuteronomy through in, into chapter 25. It is Chapter 24 is all about relationships. It's all about relationships. How, how we're to relate one another. The law of leverant marriage. Leverant marriage. Uh, a man takes a wife and he dies without leaving his wife with a male heir. Then the law of leverant marriage says and she is to go and appeal to his brother and say, would you take me in as your wife? Your brother left me no, no heir. And, and the brother, if he says, I'm not going to do that, then she goes to the elders. Says, my brother's brother will not do his duty to their brother's wife. And so the elders go and they say, are you going to do this or not? So I'm not going to do it. Then they have a ceremony where she in, encounters this fellow in public, reaches down, takes off a sandal, spits on him, and slaps him with a sandal. And then he is known from there, then on out, the man who was hit with a sandal. This is in this section here, the Deuteronomic Law. They go on and talk about other relationships. It's a fascinating read, believe me. Then all of a sudden, almost out of the blue, there comes this line in chapter 25, verse 4. You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. What in the world? How, where does that come up? So... What you're looking at here is, is ceremonial and judicial legislation spelled out in Deuteronomy. If you remember now, I've got to take a sidetrack real quick. When we went through the Ten Commandments years ago, I told you that when you study the Mosaic Law, there's Ten Commandments written on stone by the finger of God. These are perpetual and they are moral. And the other categories are judicial that, that pertain to Israel to keep them intact as a nation separate from the other nations. And there was also ceremonial that kept them, kept them religiously separate from the other religions of the other nations. The judicial and the ceremonial pass when Jesus comes because he is the fulfillment of that law. He was foreshadowed in the ceremonial law. I also told you what you have to look for, and we studied this at the time, but it's been years ago, I don't expect you to remember, that ceremonial and judicial law have woven within them morality. And the morality of those aspects of the law, though the laws themselves may, may pass away, the morality of that abides. And what Paul has done here is he's taken one of these, one of these judicial expressions that you don't muzzle an ox when it's treading out the grain, when, when on its surface it looks like, well, that's, that's fair to the ox. You don't want to starve an ox to death. When he, you don't put a muzzle on him so he can't eat the grain that he's, tramp, that he's, that he's trampling out and turning into, into something palatable to be cooked with. Paul says there's a moral reality that abides out of that. And so he says... You should not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen? And the idea here, is it for oxen only that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? And then Paul, under divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, it was written for our sake. This one statement in this little more than a chapter of, of Deuteronomic law about relationships 
which seems to come out of nowhere, Paul says was for us. It was for us. Because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing the crop. The point he's making is, where would be the motivation for someone to plow, thinking, why in the world am I doing this? I, I, will, I will get no benefit out of this. What do I really care whether I hit the road straight or not? The thresher, why am I doing this? Why am I harvesting and, and, and turning this harvested wheat into, uh, into grain that, that can then be made into uh, flour for bread? I, I won't get to taste any of this. Again, Paul is arguing for some, for some principles here, some economic principles that our society would do well to embrace. He makes the point, just like he made in chapter uh, 9, verse 7 and following. He's now, he's now added a plower and a thresher to his analogies. But God wasn't just talking about oxen, though it's right to think and take care of your beasts. The Bible commends that. But it's for our sake. There's a principle of, of sowing and reaping, of of, uh, of laboring and being the beneficiary of your labor. Then he says in verse 11, if we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? See his argument? Too much? Now remember what, what he's doing here. If you just take this on his face, you think, well, well, man, Paul's just, he's just wrapped up material things. No, because he's going to come to the next section and say, and yet I have rejected all of that. Every right I've just told you about, I've rejected it to practice self-denial for the sake of the gospel. If others, in verse 12, share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? In other words, if you've had others come in and labor and make this claim, would, would not we, an apostle, who was used by God to birth this church, couldn't we make the argument more so? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Paul says, in other words, I don't want somebody coming to me and saying to me, you're in this for the money. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be able to say to them, you got the wrong preacher. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service, he said, he hasn't finished his argument yet, get their food from the temple? By the way, that's true. But the, uh, the Jewish priests, the, the cadre of priests who were responsible for, for temple worship and temple sacrifice and all, a portion of the, there was an offering brought that was burnt unto God, uh, the sin offering. There was an offering brought that was the, the priests were able to retain uh, some of the unburnt portion to eat it for their health or to sell it in the marketplace, very much like what was going on in Corinth. Sell it in the marketplace. For their living. And those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings. Don't you, don't you see the principle here? That you have every right to expect that if you're going to labor, in, in this case, in gospel ministry very specifically, just as the principle applies in other areas of life, that you should have expectations, reasonable expectations. He calls them right. It's the, it's the word exousia. Jesus used it. All authority is given to me. It's exousia in heaven and on earth. In the same way, verse 14, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. And Jesus basically says it this way, just real quickly, Matthew 10.10. 10. I don't think I have the slides. It says the no bag for your journey, two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food, Luke 10, 7. Remain in the house, eating, drinking, whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Jesus taught this when he was sending them out two by two, and that's Paul's point there. He's setting all of this up to say that there are things we can claim 
but we're freest when we abandon those claims for the sake of the gospel. We're freest when we can say, well, I, I don't have to do this. I'd rather not do that. I'm not comfortable doing that. Paul says, you have liberty. You can make those claims. But you're binding yourself when you let your distastes, when you let your preferences, when you let your convenience drive the matter. You're binding yourself. You're, you're robbing yourself of experiencing the full, head-on blessedness, living in the liberty that Christ has called us to and living it, if you follow Paul's example, living it with intentional, continual self-denial. I'm going to close in a minute. I just want you to stop and think. I want you to close your eyes just a moment. Close your eyes and just go through your mind. What is it as a Christian who happens to be an American that I intentionally deny myself of for the advance of the gospel. What is it? Brothers and sisters, we're the last stronghold of this. Look at me. We're the last stronghold. Everything about our culture is absolutely, intoxicatingly self-indulgent. People do what they want to do when they want to do it. They will not be inconvenienced. They will not be troubled. Because if you trouble them, you trigger them. And if you trigger them, They've got to find a safe place and you better find an attorney. That's the culture we live in. And Christianity, first century biblical Christianity wades into this and looks like aliens to them. Unless, unless we unwittingly conform to their standards and insist on our own rights and insist on things going our way and don't stop to think Lord, am I missing opportunities here to practice biblical self-denial for the advance of the gospel? Am I, am I unwittingly saying, I want the gospel to advance, but I want it to advance around my agenda, my convenience, my preferences, my tastes? What I'm telling you today is not easy. Because the culture that we live in knows absolutely nothing of this and hates the suggestion of it. And there may even be people sitting here, I, I pray to God not, who are chafing under the notion of this. Guess what? Christianity is not about and never was about you and me. It's about Christ and Him exalted. It's about Christ being lifted up. It's about Christ who did not come to be served but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many And he says, he said in the New Testament, and he says to anyone who will listen today, you want to come after me? You deny yourself. First thing. Everything else is pretty much irrelevant. If, it, if we don't head on, face head on, deny myself. That's what Paul's appealing to here. Not easy to preach, not easy to live. But it is true, and it must be increasingly true of you and of me. If we're going to become all things to all people, to win some. 
For whom are you being a candle? For whom are you being a stepping stone? For whom are you being a compass? That's the question we've got to answer. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you today in Jesus' name. We thank you for this passage. We thank you for the Apostle Paul. We thank you for the way you taught him by your spirit. Because I, I, I promise you, Lord, I would not have ever seen do not muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain as a moral principle to be applied today. Oh, Father, more than that, I pray that we are not blind to ways that we could be practicing self-denial for the sake of the gospel. Lay upon the hearts of these people here this day some soul who is groping in darkness and blindness and perhaps waiting for us to be the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ to them. Help us to learn from Paul. Help us to be taught by your spirit the truths of this passage which go way beyond what an apostle claims or what an apostle denies. And make it flesh and bones for us today. But we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me.